Good evening, everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land from which we speak is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Welcome, everyone, to Storm and Fury, a conversation about the Capitol Hill riot. Two months have passed since that fateful day, and we are still talking about the insurgents, the first attack on the U.S. Capitol in over two centuries. Its repercussions linger, and experts are still trying to understand what exactly had occurred to culminate in such a dangerous and unsettling event. Our panel, which involves four faculty members from Carleton University, will consider the events of January 6th from our unique disciplinary perspectives and what that day might mean for the United States and Canada moving forward. A few notes regarding procedures for this evening. After these opening remarks, I will show a short video that features uncommented footage from that morning leading up to the outbreak of violence, followed by clips from the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests in Portland. I will then introduce the panelists. Each of us will briefly provide our perspective on the events of that day. Panelists will have a chance to talk among ourselves, and then the discussion will open up to you, the audience. We ask you to use the webinar Q&A function to post your questions. Please be brief. We'll be monitoring it and we'll take the questions in turn as they appear. As mentioned, I've assembled a video with raw footage of the sights and sounds from the January 6th protest, extending from the Trump rally to a point before the storming of the Capitol. And again, at the end, I've added clips from the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland uh, for the sake of comparison. Emma, uh, the video, please. USA!
Now to the panel. I, James DeVille, organizer of the panel, uh, teach music in the School for Studies in Art and Culture and have published and blogged about music at the 2012 and 2016 Democratic and Republican Party conventions. Based on the montage of scenes from 1-6 that you just saw, I'll present the soundscape up to the riot and I'll discuss what it tells us about the participants. Our next panelist is Andrew M. Johnston, who teaches modern U.S. history and international relations history at Carleton. He'll look at January 6th through the longer history of mass political insurrections in U.S. history, as well as how the world has interpreted the riot as evidence of peculiar characteristics of American history. Our third speaker, Melissa Hausman, is a professor of political science and has written about comparative federalism and women's sexual and reproductive health rights. She will discuss the increasing polarization in the House and Senate, especially since the Gingrich years. These have been, there have been changes in both parties based on regional shifts. And finally, Adrian Harewood is a CBC radio and television journalist currently co-hosting CBC Ottawa's Weekday News. He has studied political science and history at McGill and Carleton and is also an adjunct professor at Carleton School of Journalism and Communication. He will look at the challenges facing U.S. media in the context of the country's political polarization before and after January 6th. So I'll begin by addressing the sounds of the fury. What you saw and heard was raw footage of soundscapes from the events occurring between the Trump rally and the storming of the Capitol on January 6th and from Black Lives Matter protests in Portland in 2020. Soundscape is a term popularized by Canadian composer and acoustic ecologist R. Murray Schaefer for any acoustic environment, whether natural or produced by human activity. As you could hear in my montage, the boundaries between sound and music are porous, and for an action like chanting, its rhythmic aspect lends musicality. What's important is its uh, production by voice, which humanizes and musicalizes the chanting, whatever the context, and invites others to participate, especially considering, unlike singing, this type of vocalization does not rely on the ability to sing in tune. The group of conservative and radical right pr protesters had a limited repertoire of chants at their disposal, mostly the simple USA and Stop the Steal. As anthropologist Elise Brenner notes, quote, chants make demands, expose truths, and build identity and commonality in a participatory way. Social protest chanting and singing are participatory and collective actions, not merely a top-down performance of one musician." End quote. A recent article on climate change demonstrations notes how political conservatism correlates with individualism, also in protest contexts. This may help to explain why our video seems to reflect visually and orally a mass that does not really seem to cohere, unlike the organized and experienced protesters in Portland. The rallying cries in DC are not maintained at the length and with the persistence that characterizes those in Portland where they serve as part of a sonic strategy of protest. Experience has taught demonstrators that simple three or four syllable chants are the most effective for memorability and also for media attention, whether I can't breathe, Black Lives Matter, or from the other side, stop the steal. The footage from Washington suggests that the Trump rally participants were not experienced protesters, but rather citizens responding to what they perceived as a call, seditious as it was. Their let's make a deal costumes remind me of Tea Party activists from several years ago who placed a premium on visuality in contrast with the orality 
practiced by the Occupy Wall Street movement with their human microphone, drum circles, and repertoire of chants. It's the difference between an organized protest movement for social justice and, well, let's say a mobocracy serendipitously united by opposition to diverse causes. Whatever the political stripe, the protesters' confrontation with the police will produce the soundscape of riotous noise as witnessed later on Capitol Hill. And all of this becomes apparent when we attend more closely to the sound and fury. So I turn it now over to Andrew Johnston. Andrew, please. Thank you very much, James. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, James, first of all, for bringing us all together and, and everyone uh, who's come to, to join this conversation tonight. Um, I was thinking as you're talking about my own experiences in demonstrations and protests going back to the 80s uh, as an undergraduate student and remembering that I always found group chanting actually a very uncomfortable and difficult thing to do. I didn't mind being there in person, but I found sometimes the, the organizational aspects of it a little bit jarring. Um, and I really like the novel way that you conceive of this from the outset as a kind of a defining, trying to define this moment in, in terms of a soundscape. And, and agree with your sort of parsing of the, the differences between the collective purposes of Black Lives Matter on the one hand and the variegated protests of, the, of January 6th. Um, but well, I'm also struck by, and we'll talk about a number of things, but I'm struck by, for the vaunted libertarianism of Trump's supporters, uh, they ironically also see themselves not as a class or a segment of society, but as actually the incarnation of the people themselves, uh, battling for in this much overused expression, the soul of America. Uh, if they had a plan, it wasn't very clear or coherent. And if it depended on a single leader to inspire them, um, Trump had retreated to safety. The protesters were on their own uh, in ways that probably directly paralyzed, one might suggest the particularly parasitic nature of Trump's brand of business. Others work and take risks while he gets paid and avoids liability. Um, I'm here to represent the history department. I just wanna take a few minutes to mention four aspects of the events of January 6th that struck me in a perhaps historical sense. Um, first, the, the, there was afterwards an enormous amount of post-riot agreement amongst mainstream American politics that brought left and right together. Uh, that this was an unprecedented disgrace uh, uh, set on the hallowed seat of American democracy. But that belies, of course, that these same halls were seen differently in parts of the United States and around the world. As important as constitutional democracy unquestionably is, this Capitol building has sanctioned slavery, defended segregation, criminalized poverty, converted Lyndon Johnson's great society into a system of mass incarceration. And more to the point internationally, it's backed dozens of insurrections around the world to keep dictators in place and to undermine other people's democracies. It was a statement of staggering historical irony that George W. Bush claimed that the events of January 6th made the United States look like a banana republic which presumably could be the same, would be the same banana republic named after the United Fruit Company. That said, my second point is that like everyone, the absence on the Hill compared to the displays of force violence historically used by this American state, not just against Black Lives Matter and civil rights, but against labor, peace activists and other elements of the left was especially revealing given the widespread reporting uh, in the US intelligence community on right nationalist organizations and their intentions on January 6th, it seemed impossible to believe that they could not see this coming, which unfortunately only further lends itself to the already paranoid style of American politics. The third point I wanna talk about is that as the videos came out, we saw an almost complete absence of programmatic intent. There was a surreal moment when the rioters had breached the, I'm not sure with the Senate, cha Senate chamber or the house, and, and one of them shrugs and is overheard saying, well, I, I guess we better form a government. Stopping the confirmation of the Electoral College is not the same thing as destroying the vast deep state conspiracy that the rioters believed controlled the world. The gap, in other words, between the nature of their ideological paranoia and ambitions and their very limited plan, not to mention the speed with which the whole thing fell apart, suggests that this was not an insurrection in any real sense, but a disjointed protest that had elements of intent admittedly perhaps driven by a vanguard of organized and trained militia, but mixed with opportunism and a little bit of political tourism. Even though the protesters may have enjoyed the ideological sympathy 
and sometimes passive cooperation of police elements of police and military personnel, these institutions remained and held to the state. By all appearance, Trump's followers wanted to foment a revolutionary moment in which violence was used to extract some kind of justice against a deep state, uh, a deep state, deep state led and held together by some vast liberal conspiracy, uh, pop, uh, peopled by abortionists and other enemies of God. At the key moment, as the doors were breached, in my view, I think it was the display of force itself that was the goal, if goal is the right word. Trump, as we know, spent his presidency celebrating and rewarding acts of violence, especially when directed against members of the press. And it was this masculine celebration of force that was so emblematic of Trump's, Trump's entire strongman pitch that as he and Giuliani kept putting it that day in their very speeches, they kept addressing the importance of the fight and the combat. They used those words repeatedly without ever imagining what its political endgame or process would be. It was as though it was really only about the catharsis of a segment of society disoriented by their apparent powerlessness. And in that respect, while I would focus on the frustrated white male privilege that feeds all of this, of course, many people like Thomas Frank in November, just after the election, point out when the Democratic Party abandoned its working class New Deal roots in the 1990s, it left the road open for, and I quote, a particularly poisonous species of right wing dem demagoguery. This noted with some futility last November has grown sick of plutocracy, but neither party will take that on. My final point is to look at the, the group of Trump supporters and ask how it is that they came to speak or believe themselves to speak for or to be and represent the people, capital P. All of this was possible because of the longer history of conspiracy theories that find unusually fertile soil in American political culture. And the reason for that is that the Republic was built without the stabilizing features of a monarchy or an established church. It has struggled throughout its history to define its national identity, or more accurately, rather individual groups has demon, have demonized perceived outsiders to consolidate their narrow def definition of that identity around their particular bastions of economic authority. And so anti-alien movements help to develop a sense of community in this young conflict-ridden country. And it's this very fluidity of American life that exacerbated status anxiety, which could only be stabilized by striking out against hidden enemies. The fact that America was simultaneously calling itself a chosen land with a providential mission, while trying also to build a singular identity out of all its diversity, meant that it was also one that believed it was constantly surrounded by deadly enemies from within and without. And so in the 19th and 20th century, American politics was buffeted by wave after wave of conspiracy theories about who or which group was plotting secretly destroy, to destroy the nation. Catholics, Irish, Freemasons, natives, slaves, hyphenated Americans, Bolsheviks, Jews, Japanese, Chinese, and so on. And after the First World War, this coalesced in a different direction. The American state itself became the potential, uh, the potential to be the greatest threat to freedom because of the new power it had acquired to surveil American society as America's world power grew. And it's no surprise that it was immediately after the First World War that we see the emergence of the first infamous spider web charts designed to connect trade unions to professors, to socialists, to feminists, to immigrants, to Jews in one seamless conspiracy whose aim was to destroy the mythic soul of a free nation. Since the 1930s, the country has only bounced from one plot to another, from Pearl Harbor to homosexuals in the State Department, the Kennedy assassination to Watergate, COINTELPRO and the Church Committee, Iran-Contra to 9-11. Americans were increasingly willing to believe the view that shadowy insiders had taken over their government. And because everyone was ironically trying to use the state to track down their enemies from within, this democratically elected government itself was now seen by all sides as a potential threat. All of this is to say that conspiracies have been an unusually normal part of American politics, but they have been exacerbated in recent times by the anger generated by economic inequality, by the echo chambers of the media. Of course, what is perhaps unprecedented is a president willing to exploit both of these. Given its historically, culturally enduring roots, I have to be honest that I find it difficult to picture what will stop this from getting worse. That's all. Thanks, James.
thank you, Andrew. And I turn it over now to Melissa uh, from, and uh, political science perspective. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be part of this panel. Thanks for putting it together. I would start by noting that there are two unique aspects, well, at least, but I'm gonna um, center on two of US politics, which I think have contributed um, to some of this um, strategizing, et cetera. The first is of course, that the states run the elections and um, Congress then certifies the electoral college count as done in the states. The other piece that's very important to remember and that I think sometimes people don't remember is that the incentive structure is very different in the US because unlike most of the parties in Canada, the state parties are in fact part of the national structure. And so one gets promoted by behaving a certain way at the state level if one in fact wants to then get elected to Congress later um, or you know, even run for president. So those are things that I think are important. And I would say given the polarization across the parties which has arisen since the Republicans basically traded places with the Democrats as the party of the South onwards since the 1980s. It began at the presidential level, then went down to the congressional level. The Republican party has moved to the right, the Democratic party a little bit to the left, but more to the center, but huge polarization within Congress. And we saw some of the effects of that in terms of the refused next to um, support the certification of Biden's election in January. Now, one member of Congress in particular, Gohmert, was trying to prolong things and filed a challenge at the federal appellate level. And of course, the challenge is centered around Arizona and Pennsylvania. And that's what led us to January 6th and 7th in terms of you know what was going on inside Congress in terms of the legal uh, vote counting that was going on. And one thing I should mention is that a really terrific political scientist from whom I quote a lot, a man named Sean Terrio, has written a great book called The Gingrich Senators. And he basically talks about how the scorched earth policy started by Newt Gingrich when he called himself the prime minister of the house in his four short years as speaker, even though he had been a house member from Georgia since the 80s, former history professor, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> We've got plenty in political science too, trust me. Um, but basically that the party in terms of its ideology, specifically in terms of, the, of its representatives in Congress moved, the representation moved between a half to two thirds to the right. And this was actually because of member replacement, not because of ideological, um, huge changes on the part of the, the existing members. It was because basically we saw a replacement of what are variously called blue dog Democrats, yellow dog Democrats, people like Bill Clinton, Blanche Lincoln and others by more ideological Republicans. And what's really interesting is in this book, he talks about how they continued their behavior once they got to the Senate and really changed the way the Senate has worked. And so, we look at people like Lindsey Graham, Mike Lee of Utah, Tom Cotton, some others who behave much like we would expect a House member to behave, not like I'm one of you egalitarian members of the Senate and that everybody is equal and that we see coalition politics and reaching out across the aisle. That stuff died starting in the 1990s. And so basically I think it was really, um, no great surprise to expect that a president who wanted to throw a firecracker into all this would do so, or as somebody once called um, Giuliani, a hand grenade. They basically threw themselves into this mix and tried to blow it all up. Now, in terms of the certification process of electoral college votes, I don't want to bore everyone and go into it in huge detail, but there have only been a couple of recent instances, and this was by a single member of the House and the Senate after Nixon's first victory in 1968 and after W's victory in 2004. But here we're talking about in January, leading up to January 6th and 7th, 2021, we're talking about 36 different states, 36 different congressional delegations voting to object, working with the refused Nicks who didn't want to certify Biden's election. 
and 139 House members, including the House Minority Leader, which is frankly shameful, Kevin McCarthy of California. And then we saw senators from five different states doing the same in terms of trying to hold everything up. And of course, then some nicely changed their positions and decided, oh, they wouldn't hold things up after all, you know, after the riots. But clearly, there was a lot of shameful and frankly unprofessional rhetoric and behavior and actions going on. The party seeing still seeing itself as being tied to Trump. And we had some of the usual suspects. In addition to Kevin McCarthy, some of the others, um, representatives from Florida, Diaz Ballard, who's actually the brother of the famous commentator in US News, um, Gates from Western Florida, Jim Jordan, a reliable Trump supporter, Lauren Boebert of Colorado, who you know is the pistol packing mama who avoids the metal detectors when she goes into Congress, uh, Nunez from California, these are just some names, and um, Joe Wilson of South Carolina, who famously yelled in the middle of one of Obama's uh, State of the Union addresses, you lie. So it, some of these folks have not changed their bad behavior and really offensive. Now, when we look at the, the composition of the state legislatures, this is why I'm less um, sanguine than some of my colleagues, both in the press and um, in political science about the 2022 elections. In other words, I'm worried because of course the states are the ones redrawing the district. So according to Ballotpedia right now, 23 states have Republican trifectas, which means the House, Senate and governorship are Republican. 15 of them are Democratic and 12 are divided. So that's gonna highly impact how these districts are drawn. And many people expect the Democrats to lose their slash our um, majority in 2022, we'll see. Um, the other thing I will mention, and this goes to this stop the steal rhetoric and project, there are already 250 state legislative bills out there, the Washington Post has reported, in 43 states to limit voting, to figure out cute little ways to make it harder to vote in person or by mail or online for 2022. This is opposed to 33 states in 2020 before the 2020 election. The Republicans have had two long-term projects aimed at increasing and holding their majority in the state legislatures. The red, the red map project of Karl Rove for 2010, which was successful, and the one that's called Right Lines that helped them hold and uh, actually increase their representation in 2020. The other thing I'll just finish on in case we're wondering whether polarization still matters, and of course it mattered in terms of what led up to the public rhetoric around January 6th and 7th, is that as various commentators have noted, there wasn't a single Republican vote in the House or the Senate for the stimulus bill over the last few days. So polarization still exists and it exists at the state levels where these districts are drawn and it obviously exists in Congress. So, you know, I don't think Biden's got a cakewalk in front of him by any means. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Melissa. Finally then, uh, Adrian Harewood. So, Adrian. Thanks so much, James. And, and it's a real honor to uh, be on this esteemed, amongst these esteemed panelists. So, so thanks so much for, for inviting me. Um, I, I think the, the thing that really struck me uh, about the, the way in which uh, this, this story was covered, I was struck by how surprised so many media commentators were uh, how they were constantly suggesting that what they were seeing was unthinkable. It was un unbelievable. Um, and, and to me, it, it, it betrayed a lack of understanding of, of the history of the United States. And, and, it, and it suggests obviously that, that we in the media have to do a much better job of putting things into historical context and making connections because what happened on January 6th, to me at least from my vantage point was very thinkable. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't really that shocking in, in many ways. And, and what it suggests to me is that we probably need to be reading more science fiction. <laughs> we, pro we, probably need, we probably need a lot more imagination and we, we need more, more history 
Um, you know, this, this notion, I think Joe Biden at one point said that what happened on the 6th was un-American. We, we heard that, that said over and over again. Um, and and people, how all these pundits were constantly in a state of, of disbelief. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges that we faced on January 6th um, as journalists and media practitioners was, was trying to name what we were seeing. What, what was actually going on? The, the power to name matters. Uh, the Trump supporters who breached the Capitol building called themselves American patriots, uh, but were described at the time by various media organizations and personalities in the following terms, uh, protesters, uh, insurrectionists, mobsters, rioters, extremists, seditionists, violent insurgents, terrorists, domestic terrorists. What you call them said much about what you thought they were doing. Um, if you frame them as mere protesters, as Tucker Carlson from, from Fox News did, well, that, that's much less sinister than, than labeling them domestic terrorists, which, which carries with it a much more, much more serious and, and grave implications. One Canadian reporter in Washington, D.C. said that the demonstrators didn't look like the kind of people who would invade the Capitol building, which itself raises some questions, again, about the reporter's understanding of U.S. history, because the same comment could have been made about the mobs of ordinary looking folks who surrounded the young African-American children as they attempted to enter Central High High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, in the 1950s, or, or the mobs of people who would regularly gather for the thousands of lynchings, some 6,000 lynchings that took place between 1865, I think in 1950 in the United States. Uh, the thousands who, who, who went there and looked at, at these lynchings as a kind of a spectator sport. As Daniel Kilgo, professor of journalism at the University of Minnesota has argued, we know that how media portrays unrest as riot or resistance has an effect on the public discourse. Ultimately, it helps to shape the public's views of the protest's aims. Now, a, a brief survey of how the media, how the media covered the events reveals actually some interesting truths. We know that traditional media ha has been taken to task for how they've covered civil rights protests going back to the 1960s, which were often framed as public nuisances. Anti-Black racism um, demonstrations, like those we saw in 2020, have tended to be framed as riots. Uh, conservative protests have normally less likely been seen as nuisances. Now, interestingly, in this instance, much of the mainstream news media on, on January 6th at the, um, framed the, the Capitol building siege as, um, carried, as having been carried out by a mob. So CNN labeled what took place as terrorism, um, which is not actually how white supremacists have, have tended to be labeled. So, so that's, that seems to be something, something new. Um, some news media like USA Today actually went so far to compare the different ways in which the Black Lives Matter protests were policed in comparison with the Capitol siege. Uh, even in the early hours of, of the coverage, Fox News tended to frame the events in a similar fashion to the other mainline networks. However, 24 hours after the Capitol riot, the homepage of one American news network, uh, OAN, had no pictures of the protests. Imagine, no pictures of the protests, which is significant, which is interesting, because a lot of people only get their news from OAN. Breitbart had an image of Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and described how Facebook had blacklisted Trump following the event. Um, we, we, we saw also you know, various attempts in the coverage to conflate uh, the Black Lives Matter protests that took place in 2020 with the Capitol riots. There were attempts to create what I would argue are false equivalencies. And again, it's why critical thinking and some historical context and clarity is so desperately needed within our media. You know, those Black Lives Matter protests, and, and, and this, is, this is me talking, not CBC. <laughs> um, those Black Lives Matter protests were at their core demonstrations against the killings of unarmed Black people. One can see the demonstrations as an affirmation that Black lives are valuable lives, 
that they're lives of human beings and thus should be recognized as valuable and worthy of protection. Objectively speaking, these demonstrations were a response to years and years of dehumanization and the negation of the worth of black life. Ostensibly, the demonstrations were about the pursuit of racial justice because the system doesn't seem to respect the full humanity of black people. So Black Lives Matter ought not to be understood as an expression of black superiority, but an expression of black equality, black humanity. We didn't see any symbols of anti-white hatred. Black Lives Matter protests were not about reinforcing authoritarianism. It wasn't about fascism. They didn't, there wasn't a kind of anti-democratic core to the demonstrations. However, on the contrary, the, the white nationalism on display in Washington, D.C. on January 6th was an expression of dominance, you know, an expression of white superiority, uh, white supremacy, and, and at times anti-blackness. Also, there were symbols of anti-Semitism in that, in that demonstration. We, we saw forms of white supremacy on the march. The Confederate flag was displayed uh, for the first time inside the Capitol in what? And, and, and Andrew would know this better than I would as the historian, but I think it was what? Over 200 years, right? The first time that the, that the, that the Confederate flag had appeared in the Capitol building. Um, you know, so, so I, you know, I, I should also state that, that, that just going back to this, this sense of surprise, this, this disbelief, we, we need to remember that in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was the Wilmington riot, you know, which, which was really a, a bona fide coup d'etat. Uh, a white mob effectively displaced an elected, well, sorry, displaced elected black and white officials with white supremacists. These were duly elected folks. Um, and, and they were basically removed from office by a mob and replaced by white supremacists. Um, and this, of course, was, was part of the a reaction to uh, Reconstruction, right? Um, and, and, and it was a reaction to the fear of, of, of Black people uh, being able to, well, imposing themselves on the political sphere. You know, Black people actually being able to um, demonstrate their agency, right? So it was, it was almost as if Black freedom was uh, a threat uh, to white liberty. Um, and, 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 and the, the white um, ability, or, or, or rather the ability of white folks to fully express their, um, their kind of political dominance, shall I say, in that sphere. Um, I, I feel as if I've, I've probably taken up a little bit too much time. So I'm gonna end it there. I have a couple other things to say, but I'll, I'll allow James to uh, take back my microphone and, and, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Well, thank you, Adrian, and thank you all the panelists for your comments and keeping them well in time. So first, uh, do we have, are there any uh, questions or is there a point of discussion among the panelists? I suspect that um, since I am chairing this, I'll take the, the word first and just say, is there any hope then? Because it seems uh, like the message that we're hearing, whether it's about the Congress or historical patterns or the press, seems to be one that's uh, of uh, not despair, but certainly a gloomy forecast. Uh, can any of you speak to that? I mean, either to confirm that or to deny it. <laughs> Well, I, think, I, I mean, I, I ended. Sorry, Adrian. I, go ahead. I, I, I ended on a on a gloomy note, and it was probably unfair of me to do so. But I think partly, and it maybe speaks to something that Adrian uh, mentioned, just sort of you know about when we're talking about journalism and the results of the uh, the, the, the the way press reactions to the event changed. Um, I still go back to the to the way in which the particular mode by which people receive their political information uh, and the kind of uh, loss of perceived loss of faith. And I don't know if this is your view, Adrian, uh, in, in uh, journalistic authority 
um, really opens up the political field to um, a, a very different thing than, than countries, and this is not just the United States, other countries as well, uh, has experienced before in terms of, and from my vantage point, my you know, midwife theory thing is that has always existed, but there's always been moments where, um, you know, a, a, a well-respected journalist or news anchor uh, has finally said, you know, enough is enough, uh, whether it's McCarthyism or Vietnam or what have you. And journal, the American journalism hasn't always worked that way, but it seems as though it will never work that way again. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh um, died on, I think it's February 17th. Uh, so a little over a month after uh, the, the Capitol riots. Uh, and, and I think we, perhaps we underestimate the power that Rush Limbaugh has exerted on American political life. Um, Rush Limbaugh uh, dominated radio. He was the most listened to uh, radio journalist, radio host in America. He had 15 million people listen to him on a weekly basis. Mm. Um, you know, Rush Limbaugh at the end of his life was making $84 million a year. And, and, and that speaks to, you know, the, the kind of reach that he had. He was, a, he was an incredibly powerful figure. Uh, and, and, you know, I would argue that he, he helped to contribute to what is now a very kind of toxic uh, political culture and a very toxic media culture as well. And he had an inordinate amount of uh, influence um, on the Republican Party, you know, to the point where, you know, along with Newt Gingrich, you know, Rush Limbaugh was, was effective, effectively giving Republicans their marching orders. Right? He, he, was, he was basically telling Republicans what they could and couldn't do and, 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 and basically saying that if they, if they failed to um, follow the agenda, right, that they would essentially be voted off the island. You know, he had that kind of, he had that kind of power. Um, and, and so I think we would be, um, it would be a mistake, right, to underestimate the, his significance as a figure and, and the, the amount of control that he exerted and how, you know, Donald Trump is, is really in many ways a, a son, although he's older, <laughs> but he's the son of Rush Limbaugh. R Rush Limbaugh, in many ways, prepared the ground, right, that allowed someone like a, a Donald Trump uh, to emerge. Um, uh, the, and and the, kind of, the kind of toxic rhetoric, right, that has become all too common uh, in, in, in American life. You know, you, one only had to listen to, to Rush Limbaugh uh, to, to, to understand the, the, the lexicon, like to understand how people were, able, where, where people were getting their language from, uh, right? Uh, I, I think I, yeah. I think Rush 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 certainly uh, imposed himself on the situation. Melissa, did you have something to say to that, or or to the comments so far? I would just add quickly. I'm Trump. Trump helped break U.S. politics. There's no question about it, and that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he was elected to do by these folks who followed him sometimes against their own interests. I think the one thing I would just add is, you know, since Citizens United, um, <laughs> there's really very few ways to rein in money in US politics. It's a pay to play system. I'm currently working on a piece about how Theresa May got defenestrated by her own party in, in the UK. And there's, um, and this is gonna sound like conspiracy theory coming from a lefty, so there we go. But the Atlas Network, which is funded by some very big um, corporate interests, they also help fund what's known as the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is where a lot of these trial bills come from that get passed in the state legislatures and then get brought up for scrutiny in court. So the money thing is also very, very important. Um, I mean, small donors for Trump, but also very, um, well, there's these, groups that are very difficult to untangle so i'll just say that some uh, some pundits uh, bewail the loss of civility but my takeaway from all of your comments is that there really wasn't much civility or am i misreading american history uh in that regard it's interesting to think about what our memory this is one of the things i i'm struck by when when news talks about polarization um, you know, I was a grad student uh, 
and no, as a starting out as a professor and a grad student in the eighties and a professor in the, in the nineties. And, and, and Melissa has talked about Newt Gingrich and uh, you know, you, if you were around for the 94 midterm elections, um, there, there, you know, that the rhetoric was always, was already there. And, and again, the, the, the animus toward Ronald Reagan in the eighties from people and Ronald Reagan's animus towards other people. Um, that was when I was developing my political consciousness. And it always seemed to me at that point, very polarized. And it's a two party system and it can't, it can't, it, it is a winner. It is a zero sum political game between these parties. And I think that lends itself to it. Mm. And I would say, Adrian, just to, the predecessor, of course, to Limbaugh was Charles Father Coughlin in the 1930s, who used the radio to have millions of followers out of Detroit uh, to to attack the Jewish conspiracy uh, that caused the Depression and, and the New Deal and all those other things. So, uh, you know, he faded from view. You know, things things changed, but the, the radio itself proved to be at that moment the the opportunity for for unregulated access to voters to just span a number of conspiracy theories or par or or racist arguments about about uh, how the world operated. Well, I'm going to turn it to the Q and A because the questions are coming in fast and furious, and uh, I want to make sure that we are able to get to them. Um, okay, now let's see. Yeah, I think the first two questions have already been answered. Someone. Uh, um, someone is asking, can you also speak to the international context? And I presume they mean beyond Canada, but um, uh, could someone then speak to uh, that? Can, can I ask uh, Miranda to you know, the international context of how January 6th was received or viewed by the rest of the world or uh, how America will, will move forward in the future? Because I, I mean, in thinking about it, I, you know, I know that was kind of one of the things I was supposed to think about, um, and and one of the things I didn't say uh, was, you know, about how different powers, like China, for example, made a great deal not just about the disarray in Washington, but the irony of the Americans um, uh, celebrating uh, Hong Kong protesters who broke into the Parliament of Hong Kong in July nineteen nineteen, uh, twenty nineteen. I mean, sorry. Um, oh, I see Miranda. It, it, yeah, talking about, you mean the wider ways in which Trump uh, represents part of uh, a, a populist right um, in the world that, that connects the, these elements of the U.S. with um, uh, populist right wing movements in Eastern Europe and with Brexit and so on. Yeah, I mean, you can see this is the thing I suppose was wrong about my argument where I talk about the unique features of American history. That lend itself to conspiracies and and these kinds of populist arguments because we see them cropping up everywhere and kind of reinforcing each other. Um, but maybe my my colleagues have more uh, engaging things to say than I do. Well, I think that's a a good uh, a good response for now, and we can come back to that. Then, oh, can I just jump in with one quick yeah. thing? Um, a lot of commentators have said that the Republican Party has become the party of angry white men, um, but it's also the party of some suburban and married white women. Um, but we also know that in 2020, there were um, certain um, folks, you know, Latin Americans, Latinos, Latinas, who were voting for um, the Republicans. And it's very interesting to me that Biden has already set out an olive branch to Venezuelans in terms of um, <clears throat> their status in the United States. And I think that might have a little bit of an electoral basis to it. I'm just going to say that. So, yeah. I, I do think, though, that we, we can't, uh, we, we do have to mention that, that that strong sense of grievance, right, that many of those folks who were in, who were part of that riot actually feel like they, they really feel that their country is, is under attack, or the country that they imagine Right is under attack, and that it's lost. Right, they they feel they they actually feel dispossessed. Right, and and they and they they're they're fearful of being replaced. Um, but but you know, I think what what's maybe not happening enough in, in media is we are not really talking about 
the roots of the United States, like where, how did the, how did the United States come to be, you know, <laughs> right? Like how did, where, where did it come from, right? The United States began thanks to an invasion, right? Like that's, that's, a, that's effectively what, what took place, right? An invasion, which was an apocalypse, right? For the people who actually lived on this, in this territory, right? Uh, right, the indigenous peoples of Americas, of the Americas, they were invaded, right? And they were erased, right? There, there, there was a genocide that, that took place, right? And that where, where tens of millions of people were snuffed out. And there really hasn't been a, a reckoning uh, with, that, with that past. And so when these folks are talking about being replaced and being dispossessed, you know, it, it, we need to ask the question in media, dispossessed of what? Like, what did, did you, did you own this? Is it, was it, was it yours to, was this yours to lose? Um, you know, perhaps like those are, those are some questions I, I think in terms of invoking history, those are some questions that we need to be asking more, I think, as media um, practitioners. Yeah. And that, that brings me to the next question, which is uh, about should, uh, because uh, the idea then uh, should we hang on to the CBC and BBC and the idea of public broadcasting, or is that a fading idea? And I think that, Adrian, now maybe you would need to <laughs> step out of your CBC hat but uh, to answer that. But Well, my flip answer is, you know, my kids need to eat. So, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um... You know, I, I think I think that uh, you know, obviously, I have a conflict of interest here, but 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 I, I but I but I do think that 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 um, public broadcasting does have a role to play in contributing to civil discourse, uh, and I and I think that um, you know, I think that public public broadcasting, I think they've made positive contributions over the decades to um, you know providing the population with information um, that, or, or, or rather they've helped to kind of reflect the country back to itself, right? That's really, mm -hmm. that's really the role of the CBC, right? Um, you, you can argue as to whether it has accomplished that, like certainly um, the CBC has not been as representative historically of Canada's uh, racial diversity, yeah. right? One can say that, but I think that one can say that that that, that the, the CBC has done a pretty good job of reflecting the regional diversity of the country, uh, and and at least in attempting to reflect, you know, the many different stories. Uh, and I and I would argue that that ABC in Australia and the BBC as well. I think they've done much to raise the level of the discourse as well. Um, I, you know, I think that the many, the, the, the quality of the programs are, are, are quite high, um, um, you know, but again, I, I have a, I have a, I have a stake in this, so I won't, I won't go on any longer. I'll, I'll let others but engage. At in least that at one debate. time, though, they were talking about, you know, broadcasting for the common good. Um, but what is the common good these days? And has that actually then, uh, disappeared, shall we say, uh, with also the erosion of civil discourse. Well, uh, perhaps I pose that as a rhetorical question rather than anything else, but it's something to consider. Um, Melissa, this question gets to, I think you'd be well qualified to answer it about the, should the Democrats kill the filibuster in order to get the electoral form bill, reform bill, HR1 passed? Yeah, well, there's some issues with the electoral reform bill too. I mean, it's great that the, the House has taken it up and all that, but um, some of those things in it belong to the states. So part of it is unfortunately symbolic. Um, they were doing a really good interview tonight. Actually, I watched Judy Woodruff on um, PBS <laughs> interview. <laughs> um, Mitch McConnell right before I got on and you know he was talking about how both sides have used the filibuster and filibuster threats. Um, it's hard to say because um, polarization is polarization and you can use a filibuster or a filibuster threat, but if you don't have bipartisan consensus, and that's the real issue here, 
Mm. Um, you know, if you can't avoid getting to a 50 50 tie, then you got a problem. And, you know, I think there is a problem in this, in this Senate. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice, but I'm not sure it'd fix things. Mm. Uh, well, to continue uh, with you, uh, uh, this person um, asks you in the spirit of not allowing a crisis to go to waste, do you think the events of January 6th will result in any material, now I place emphasis on any, material change in the way the U.S. government operates? But I think that others uh, can also address that. Anybody got any positive views? <laughs> I mean, the irony is, of course, that they were saying that once uh, the Dems take the House, the Senate, and the presidency, that gridlock will be over. But uh, unfortunately, we're seeing that that it's and especially with what you prognosticated and others have for 2022, and especially the grassroots organizing of the Republican Party. Um, so um, are there any changes for the good to come out of this, uh, from this event, other than people being put away who might be <laughs> best kept off the streets? I mean, that, that's sort of the paradox of it. The, my immediate reaction when I saw these events was to say, well, this presumably discredits Trump uh, and his followers. And then as the weeks went by, you sort of watched that widely shared consensus sort of weaken at the edges um, and people positioning and seriously talking about his return in 2024 and then not voting for his, you know, his removal from his, his, his impeachment. And, and those developments suggested that I mean, in everyone, the media is obviously talking about this a great deal. This is an existential crisis for the Democratic Party, and for sorry, the Republican Party. I don't I mean, it is, the Dems. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it is in a sense for the Democrats for the same reason that Melissa is pointing out uh, in terms of how things are fought out in the state level, uh, such that a party that is continually represented in the polls as a minority party can still hold power federally. Um, and, you know, there's the Senate and they're all, you know, maldistributing the representation of Americans as well. There are lots of undemocratic things that were built into the Constitution from the beginning uh, as a salve, as a way of getting the southern states into the Union from the very beginning. So, you, you know, we're, it's, it's weird to think about the fact that the distemper of our contemporary politics owes an enormous amount to the political navigations of the Constitutional Convention and the efforts on the part of the framers to bring the slaveocracy into the United States. And we're still paying the price for that. Mm. Uh, in a way, it, it raises a question. Uh, what is the United States, if not a democracy <laughs> uh, at this point? But where is the power? Um, it's not in the media necessarily. It's also, is it uh, Jeff Bezos? And, corporate interests or, uh, you know, I, I throw that open as a question to experts here. <laughs> that's that's well, not a small question, James. It's gonna... <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it sounds, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's a bit cliche, but the power is always with the people, isn't it? Right? Like ultimately. Hmm. Uh, okay. So, so, um, you know, the, the French French philosopher Jacques Rancière uh, yeah. wrote a book about, called The Hatred of Democracy. Um, he talked about the fact that, uh, you know, in the past, before democracy, who got to rule was determined by heredity or by the church or what have you. And in, in a democracy, the decision about who gets to rule is determined by um, other informal social powers. And so the who you know the theory of democracy is anyone can rule. That's his point. The practice of democracy is that only certain people are considered qualified. And over the years, those qualifications were uh, gendered, and were racial, and were economic. And those barriers have fallen, but they retain their veracity. I think in American politics to this day, 
or in all, all democratic politics to this day. Um, and so what the point of that is, is to say that in effect, all democracies are a kind of social oligarchy. Whoever at any given moment mm -hmm. represents or co contains the most social power uh, is the one that has the power to, uh, to construct the way democratic politics is played out. And the party system certainly gives us the, the appearance of contest um, but I think the and the paradox of the American system is that there's all this polarization, and yet at the same time there's cynicism that it doesn't matter what party's in place, the social and economic order of the country will not change, and either that's because of of gridlock, or it's because in fact at root neither country neither party is in a position to challenge the social order that underpins this. That's the pessimistic view. Um, Adrian's invocation of the people might be more optimistic, and I, I would love to hear it. <laughs> well, I think I think that that history. I think that what the greatest, and you would know you would know this better than I would, Andrew. The greatest what social movement of the 20th century, really, in the United States, was the civil rights movement, right? And it was mm -hmm. not it was not a, a movement that was controlled by any particular party, right? It was controlled by essentially people organizing themselves, right, to uh, change the conditions in their the various communities that they they occupied, right, and and it, it it had a it had a huge impact on on social life on political life in the country, uh, and you know that movement probably you know could not have been predicted, you know five or ten or twenty years earlier, mm. or maybe even a year before, uh, nineteen fifty five and the launch of the Montgomery bus boycott. Who who would have even imagined that a figure like a Martin Luther King? Uh, could emerge out of that and 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 become such a significant uh, figure in in American life. Why, you know, we could not have predicted that. So, um, history is always up for grabs, isn't it? <laughs> and, Certain and, and, limits, I guess. Um, yeah, 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 I just wanted to add. I mean, for me, the one positive aspect of 2020 was Stacey Abrams and you know Raphael Warnock. I mean, obviously John Ossoff as well, but. You know, and beating yeah. back Kelly Leffler and yeah. Purdue and all that in Georgia. I mean, I think that's very um, heartwarming. But the other thing is, you know, when Andrew's talking about the social constraints and in most legislatures and executives of the world, they're still male. So, um, you know, we're doing better, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we have a ways to go. Well, yeah, we the do. question that leads to. Well, not exactly directly, but it does. There's the question about could this happen in Canada? And that is, I suppose, the elephant in the room, not to be referring to the Republican Party, but rather <laughs> the proverbial elephant. Um, any thoughts about can January 6th occur here? Similar things, I think. I mean, you know, look at Jason Kenney. Um, stoking the flames of resentment or you know you go back to Duplessis in Quebec I mean you know I'm one who rejects that Canadian politics is always nicer than U.S. politics um storming storming the the capital well you've you've had individuals do it here but Indiv yes yeah not the same um not the same you know mob mentality any other thoughts about that how about Adrian, looks like you're cogitating. No, no. Well, I, I, like I think, I think there have been, um, you know, moments of expression of white nationalism in this country. Like we, you know, we, we if we mm -hmm. think back to a place like what Birchtown in Nova Scotia in the mm. 18th century, right, which was a town in which, uh, you know, basically a white mob attacked um, a black community. Um, because because it was it was basically about labor, you know. It was it was it was white workers, you know, afraid of basically being being replaced by by uh, less expensive or, or, or um, black workers, um, you know. So that's 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 an example, I suppose, of of of, of a mob <laughs> in this in this country. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of other kind of moments, you know. Of course, we we know that there have been anti Asian riots. In this country, uh, in in Vancouver, you know, in, in in British Columbia, in the in the early 20th century, uh, so uh, we are certainly not immune, you know, we're certainly not immune from 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 these kinds of uh, examples. 
Well, and I think you see, you see it in the, like in with the, the fights over with indigenous groups who have blockade mm -hmm. railroads or in the, mm -hmm. the fisheries in Nova Scotia, right? The, there, the violence is is quite uh, quite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, in the Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq fish, the Mi'kmaq fishery. Yeah, but we could also look to the uh, uh, discords. Uh, the, whether they're staged or not within Parliament itself, and the issue of civility, <laughs> um, because at least uh, coming from the States, in my day, uh, you know, uh, people did not shout out, you lie, or whatever, did not have this level of uh, ongoing uh, heated discourse that we see in this Parliament and British Parliament. I wonder if it has to do with the parliamentary system itself. But I mean, there is the there is a level of discord uh, th that seems to be within the political system. I didn't. Know. Could you, Andrew? Can you comment on that or uh, anyone? Well, you no, know, I think James. I mean, it, it 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 depends. It depends more on the perception, the public perception of the legitimacy of the system. That even mm -hmm. when you disagree, you think the system is legitimate. Uh, okay. you're, you're not going to lose it. And there are moments in American history when that, uh, you know, talking about it's, it was not always civil in American history, as we know. And I'm thinking of the, the, the physical beating of, of Senator Sumner uh, in, on the Senate floor by, by a, uh, a, a white Southern congressman. Mm. Um, but of course, that, that anticipated the Civil War. So, you know, that was perhaps an idea. <laughs> that was a time that <laughs> that pointed towards what was about to happen in the rest of the country. Um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of, I, I still think the, uh, there's nothing inherently better about Canadian politics or British politics or in French politics might be a, a more obvious comparison where demonstrations are such a central part of the way in which political views are, are exercised. Um, and everything has to be hinged on what's your relationship to the French Revolution. I mean, Americans have that too. What's your relationship to the Constitution of the American? It's founding principles. Whereas Canada, uh, yeah, the parliamentary system, the, the multi-party system, the focus for a long time on Quebec uh, and, and trying to hold confederation together, it's, it's created different angles of a lot of political alliances that, I, that well, I'm not a Canadianist. I, there should be someone else stepping up here, probably Adrian. Uh, but it seems to me that that it's it's um, the, the sense of legitimacy in government is a little bit uh, perhaps stronger and less conspiratorial. But there, but we have a history of like even in the last what fifty odd years, last sixty years, we have a history of political violence in this country. Like there were, you know, I was born in nineteen seventy, and just a few years before I was born, uh, and even in the year I was born, there were all kinds of bombs that were going off. You know, every single in in Quebec, you know, right? Like like that was that was not like like bombs that kill people, right? And and this was this this was going on this was going on for years. Like I think what it, it's starting in what 63, 64? Um, there there's that wonderful new uh, documentary radio documentary that was done by Jeff Turner uh, for CBC um, mm. about the the uh, history of the FLQ. Um, and, and he documents, he documents that. So again, you know, this is not, this is not just an American phenomenon. Um, you know, we, we have examples of that here, uh, in our, in our own history as well. Well, I need also, to, of um, course. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add yeah. Western Please. alienation, you know, Alberta thinking Quebec is getting too good a deal. I mean, you know, divide and conquer politics happen everywhere. And of course the parliamentary system helped Brexit to um, happen. And that's, um, that's been a form of political violence too. I mean, um, you know, a woman, a female MP was murdered over it. So um, yeah, it doesn't yeah. assuage things, unfortunately. I will read one more question, but we have to be mindful of the time and I think Adrian probably in particular uh, has a tight timetable. Um, okay. Uh, uh, on the international note, Vincent Bevins, I think, aptly wrote after the riot that, quote, a huge amount of people that are paid to understand U.S. politics have absolutely no idea about life outside the country, end quote. Do you think that a critical reckoning with foreign policy, especially in U.S. media, is necessary to combat the notion 
that the riot was un-American and therefore adequately address its root, roots, I'm sorry. Uh, it's kind of, uh, I didn't read it so well, but you've got it on your screens too. Um, so foreign, a critical reckoning with foreign policy. And you know, with that, the, the, the um, the professoriate and the intelligentsia of the United States has been complaining about the the lack of international knowledge that American voters have. And I wouldn't say, again, that's not an American thing. No. Although because the United States um, has grown up, I think, a little bit with, with a slightly more solipsistic ideology that as a, as a kind of chosen people, the middle part of the country can very often be quite undisciplined by the reality of the outside world because they have very little contact with it. Um, and even, you know, my most benign liberal colleagues in the American historical societies that I go uh, sit with at conferences always introduce themselves and ask where I'm from. And then they say, I have to apologize. I know nothing about Canada. And, um, you know, and that was a bit sort of surprising. I probably don't know much about Mexico either. So, um, I, I don't know that anyone's ever been able to come up with a solution for uh, trying to improve America's knowledge of the rest of the world in a way that would then reflect back on America's self-understanding. And the one period where some historians, I think, have conjectured that was the case was after the Second World War, because so many people had gone overseas to fight. And Americans who had no knowledge of the rest of the world suddenly were touring Italy and France. And, and they came back with a much greater sensibility of America's connection to the world. And it's not an accident that in, uh, you know, the isolationist movement, such as it was in American politics, going back to, you know, the progressive era, the early part of the 20th century in the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, had its strengths in the Midwest and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and had it was weaker in, in the in the coastal um, parts of the world. That doesn't necessarily mean the coastal parts of the world have a more benign views of foreign policy, but um, <laughs> and because often you can argue that isolationism was a reflection of the idea that we should leave the world alone and we shouldn't imperialize the rest of the world. So th these arguments got in a lot of different different directions. But um, you know, Karen, I, I have no. Um, no strategy about how to to change that about the American public, and and I wouldn't attribute it to to all the American elites or the American press. I think the uh, you know my a lot of my American friends, other than their absence of knowledge of Canada, know an extraordinary amount about the world. Uh, you know, often from a very Marocentric perspective, but that's because uh, they're used to being when they go abroad, they're used to being treated as oh, you're the country that we have to pay attention to. Yes. My, sen my sense, though, and Melissa can correct me on this, is that, that a lot of Americans aren't aware of what their government has done. Uh, they, aren't, they aren't maybe aware of how the government has contributed to the creation of, as you alluded to, Andrew, banana republics, right? They might not be familiar with the Amer America's role in the, the coup d'etat that, that deposed, you know, Jacobo Arbenz in, in the 19, early 1950s in Guatemala, right? They might not be familiar with the role that the United States played in in uh, ousting Mohammed Mossadegh uh, from Iran in, in, mm -hmm. in the 1950s and how that has contributed to, you know, obviously it led to the ascension of the Shah and, 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 the, the, and the, um, eventually the, the Islamic revolution that took place in 1979, right? So, so I think that, that, you know, my sense, I, my suspicion is that perhaps if Americans, some Americans were aware of the role that their their, their country has played, uh, they'd be outraged <laughs> in many instances if if they if they understood all the all the details of of how these um, these these events uh, transpired. Melissa, sorry, part of the American brand is unfortunately to massage that ignorance, and I mean, yeah, I. I remember being in the US in 1980 when Reagan was first running for president. Are you tired of being kicked around in the world? I mean, 
that resonated with a lot of people, you know, and again, you know, Trump's lies. Yeah, we're going to bring back coal. It's like, yeah, really? And who believes that? Um, but yeah, you get like the Canadian embassy trying to point out to Americans that the vast majority of American states trade with Canada as their number one trading partner. Or if you ask Americans, you know, where's your oil come from? Gee, I don't know, Saudi Arabia? Well, not so much. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there is this selective ignorance that unfortunately, it, it, you know, and you can get politicians, um, you know, who like Hillary Clinton at one point supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership and later thinks it's terrible. So yeah, what's a voter to do? <laughs> mm. Can I just state for the record, though, that that that, that I, I I don't intend to engage in what some people might regard as America bashing. You know, I'm I'm someone who has a tremendous amount of regard for the contribution that Americans have made and continue to make to the world in every in every way, whether it's in terms of politics, in terms of culture, right, in terms of literature, right. The 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 amount of of richness, right, that the United States has contributed to this world is 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 phenomenal. And, and it's something that, that should be respected and celebrated. Um, but at the same time, there are there are some contradictions as well. Well, I think yeah. the that, reason... probably, that need to be that need to be noted. Yeah. Yeah. The reason we're all here is because we care yeah. about that, uh, mm -hmm. about the nation and feel that uh, this is this was uh, this incident. Uh, well, Franny uh, Noodleman has brought up the question about placing that in a broader perspective of protests like Charlottesville, for example. Um, and um, I mean, I can, I think uh, Charlottesville was, from, from my sonic perspective, was quite different. It was a rehearsed group of people, I think, rather than a bunch of uh, citizens who were attending a, a rally. And, uh, uh, but uh, that, you know, at least from the uh, sonic perspective, it was organized and it was, uh, yeah, carried out. Then, I, any other thoughts about that connection with Charlottesville? Um, it, it certainly didn't yeah. like a spur of the moment thing. Let's say that just kind of happened, but yeah, premeditated. I don't know the sources though. So it was about taking down Confederate statues. I mean, it it was not just for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that I think the media, though, generally has done a poor job or, or did a poor job of, of even explaining Charlottesville uh -huh. uh, and explaining its 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 roots. Uh, mm. And I think that there was a reluctance on the part of, of various media organ and organs to um, to articulate the the role that white supremacy <laughs> was was playing in the politics at that moment, uh, and and how it, it it probably predicted what would take place on January sixth, and and I think that it points mm -hmm. to uh, a weakness uh, in some of our media systems, in that we often don't have in our newsrooms the kind of representation that we need that would enable us to better understand the society. Right, so that there aren't there aren't enough in in terms of you know we we're talking about race, right? There's there's a lack of there's an insufficient amount of racial representation in decision making positions in many newsrooms, and and it has an impact on the coverage, uh, and 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 it ends up affecting the discourse, and and perhaps you know if we had more sophisticated uh, commentators, people with a little bit more expertise, people with an understanding of the history, like. Melissa or like Andrew, uh, like yourself, James, in the newsroom, then that would that would help to uh, help us to, to kind of establish these early warning systems, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would help us to kind of deal with, you know, what would what, what eventually happen on January 6th. Um, there's one question, and maybe we can close it up now that uh, does attend to something that you brought up, Melissa. And that was Hillary Clinton and the issue of misogyny, which has not yet been really uh, mooted in this co uh, context. Um, comments on that? 
I, I guess it's misogynist and other hate speech as well as racist. Uh, and we've discussed issues of race, I think, uh, at least to a certain extent, but the issue of uh, misogyny is one that hasn't come up. And this was directed at you, so. <laughs> um, but, you know. <laughs> it's very, um, it's very hard to restrict speech in the US. And I know Andrew knows about this. I mean, unless of course that person is a communist or a socialist, but you know, the very same freedom of speech that first amendment that protects hate speech also protects unlimited campaign contributions because money is considered speech. So ironically enough. Um, so the hate speech stuff, I mean, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, Catherine McKinnon tried to subvert that paradigm by, um, you know, passing uh, basically tort legislation in a couple of cities, but that got overturned because, hey, you know, that's that's not a problem. But we've seen horribly, horribly misogynistic attacks. I mean, look at what happened to Catherine McKenna in the last election or, you know, look what's happened to various female politicians all over the world, it's it's a very hard thing to deal with. Um, and the US is uh, one of the most, I guess, sort of overt defenders of this freedom of speech stuff. And it's it's very hard to nuance. I don't know if that's the question, but. And on the other hand, we can't just see it as an all male, uh, the protesters, for example, on January 6th, no. women, um, and, and I think Andrew brought up also suburban women and so on. Um, yeah, this is not just an all male kind of movement then. Or, nope. so. No, and, and, and you know, um, if you look back to the to the 1950s, the Republican Party was buttressed uh, very powerfully by um, uh, um, middle class American housewives. Who organize themselves to uphold the values that they believe the Republican Party ought to uphold, and out of that came, so you know, there's, um, you know, that's obviously been been a part of the tape as well, um, as 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 the, the the misogyny that goes with it. It's interesting how the um, I did have a student do a thesis on the casserole protests. How that flipped between um, Allende and Pinochet that, that, that the same protest could serve both functions, but they were also initiated by women uh, within, within the country of Chile. So, uh, and s someone made a comment, there's a long history of women supporting patriarchy, so. Sure. Andrew, can you speak to the, the history of the daughters of the American Revolution? No. No, okay. <laughs> I thought, I thought you'd okay. No, I can't. Although I think I once applied for one of their scholarships. I don't know. Maybe that's the imperial order of the daughters. The, okay. The, the daughters of the empire, whatever. Um, but there's no, also. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that yeah, they're, they're, the women haven't always been the force for emancipation, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know suffrage was opposed uh, for a long time by by American women. Yeah. My my understanding was the daughters of the American Revolution has played a, a major role in erecting a lot of Confederate statues. That's the um, daughters of the Confederacy. Yeah. That's a daughters, sorry, did I say daughters? Yeah. Okay, my, my apologies. Yeah. Daughters of the Confederacy. But you're right, they right. have, yeah. they have, yeah. and they've been among the biggest um, protesters against that. And, yeah. um, you know, if people watch Mrs. America, I always refer to that, you know, Kate Blanchett did a great job. But, um, I interviewed Schlafly for my dissertation and uh, yeah. yeah, you know, they used to bake bread and bring it to the state legislators, you know, made by the bread makers for the bread winners. It's like, oh, really gag me, you know, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my understanding is Schlafly complained bitterly about the extent to which women were not allowed into the upper organizations of the party. So, and she herself was a lawyer, right? So, you know, these are, these are people who are, um, you know, trying to kind of have it both ways. It's like, do as I say, not as yeah. I'm actually doing. Ran for Congress twice. Yeah. Well, I think we've had a very uh, wide ranging uh, discussion tonight and um, people can take away what they wish from that. I know that it will, that it will be archived for those who could not attend. Uh, that a tape is being made. I don't know if anyone would care to um, 
have a final word on uh, on this uh, topic. I think we've uh, certainly done a good job of covering it from these different perspectives, historical, political science, and from media, and even my own small contribution. So uh, from the perspective of sounds and music. So um, but any final thoughts? Melissa? Just to thank you, James, and thank, and thank the audience as well. Thank everybody who came and asked questions and, and watched us. I think it's 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 great to have uh, you know the, the the you know the continuing interest in what we do and what this subject is about, and uh, and to have such such uh, intelligent questions from from the audiences. Mm -hmm. Very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for spearheading cool. this, James. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and then I, it's great. It's great to be in be with Melissa and, and Andrew. I, I don't get to speak to the two of you as much as, as much as I would like. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Well, well it's, it's great to be able to. Yeah, yeah. on the air, Adrian. We can never get, get a hold of it. <laughs> yeah, right. I do like the tagline of the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. However, we define democracy. These kinds of discussions, though, should be going on and should continue to go on, you know, there, because it's only through exchange that I think we can profit and perhaps avoid the mistakes of the past, uh, although I could be called out for that. But in any case, thank you all for coming. Thank you for participating and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye.